Hi, my name is Zoe Rose, and I'm a cyber consultant at Baringa Partners. Um, just to give you a bit of context, Baringa Partners is a managed consultancy um, that assists to assists organizations to implement change across their industry. Think of um, energy, retail, and that. The only reason I say that is because we're hiring, so please come join me in the cyber department. Um, so my background is actually network network architecture, network security. I ended up in um, cybersecurity uh, and uh, ethical hacking. Um, and so I come to this talk kind of in a different perspective. Um, but I found, actually, uh, when you promote diversity, not just gender, but also technical backgrounds, uh, culture, et cetera, you're going to build a more resilient solution anyway. So hopefully what I say is helpful. Um, yeah, so the problem was basically how to implement privacy by design while still maintaining your, um, maintaining your normal structure, your success, and everything else. <laughs> so the, last year, Scott Helm and I actually uh, presented with BBC and ITV uh, looking at open source intelligence. So we would get in one scenario, we had up to 300 or actually over 300 targets. And in a back room with our keyboards lit, we pulled the full-on hacker. Uh, we built an image of these people's lives based on information we found online. In one scenario, we actually talked to a woman on how using the information that she provided publicly, uh, we could potentially abduct her child. And so in that talk, <laughs> we were looking at the data, the information that people are providing. So my very first talk ever was on network um, configuration management. Fast forward a couple of years from Australia to London, I've spoken on secure communications, breach response, ethical hacking, et cetera. And all of those talks were geared around how to protect that data. And then lastly, last December, so about a month ago, David Prince and I spoke on offensive security. It was a cyber awareness program that we implemented that was the theory was, or the hypothesis was, which we were later able to um, uh, validate, was if we taught non-technical users how to hack, they could better prepare, protect, and understand why these technical uh, controls are in place and how to continue cybersecurity throughout their entire life cycle. And basically, why I mention all of those things is because, to me, cybersecurity is based around implementing a holistic approach, not just, well, we're going to implement these technical controls or we're going to tell people they can't do that. It's actually, to be effective in the long term, it's looking at multiple different scenarios like technology, people, processes. And so I've separated that into three domains. And this, to me, is what cybersecurity is. It's identifying information, it's protecting that information, and then it's educating and spreading knowledge on why they're important and how to use them. So <clears throat> I learned best with stories, so I'm going to start with a story, and then I'm going to apply those domains to the story. So when I was building this talk, I actually asked my friends, you know, what, what do you think of when you think of privacy and um, ethics in the workplace? And one of my old instructors, instructors from Red River College, that's back in Canada, uh, they sent me this article. And basically what it is, is a developer, a web developer, tells us about his very first paid um, project. So Bill, the author, web developer, he got a project from a pharmaceutical company to build a website. And basically what this article, uh, web website was going to do was create um, a way to market this medication that they had just launched. However, in Canada, you can't say, this is the medication and this is what it does. You have to kind of find a roundabout way of saying it so that people still buy it. Um, and so this article, or this website, basically presented a questionnaire to the user and they filled in their answers and then it would recommend a type of medication. However, this questionnaire only ever recommended their medication. Bill didn't think much of it. Stands to reason a pharmaceutical company is going to pay for a website. They're probably going to want their medication displayed. 
The only exception is if you're currently taking that medication or if you're allergic. So he launched the website and went live. It was perfect. Everybody loved it. The company was actually so impressed, they invited the entire team out to a steak dinner. So um, Bill was getting ready, putting his shirt on, whatever, and he got a phone call from one of his colleagues. They said, have you seen the news? And Bill said, no, because he's getting ready. Um, he hadn't. And his colleague said, I'm actually not going to attend this dinner. And this is the reason. The medication that your website is marketing has led to somebody taking their own life. What's even worse is that would not be the only suicide due to side effects of that medication. And there would actually be legal battles over it. And from the time that this article was published, there was still, uh, I don't want to call it litigations, I guess. To this day, there were still people um, that were affected by it um, in legal action. And if you think about it, was Bill at fault? I mean, legally, no. He created a website to his client's specifications. They were happy. But ethically, he never asked what would be the consequence of creating this website. He never asked what the side effects would be. So if we apply that to our three domains, the first one being information, was there a, what's the word I was going to use? Was there a weakness into the recommendation of that medication? Was it a miscommunication? Somewhere along the line, did the client say, I want this to happen, but the end result isn't actually what they meant, because I'm sure you all know clients sometimes don't know what they're asking. Um, in, and, the, and then in regards to the um, sorry, protection, maybe it was that the product was supposed to be legitimate. It was supposed to recommend the right medications, but maybe it was manipulated in some way. So it was there hard controls in place to minimize that manipulation. And then the last thing is the education. Um, being as Bill was the sole developer on this website, or at least that's how it comes across in the article, he never knew the side effects of the medication. And he also didn't know if clients were supposed to go to it, get the recommendation, and then move on. He, he, he wasn't sure that, like it didn't say, speak to your GP, you know, there are side effects and these are what they are and they can be quite serious. So it wasn't fully educated to the people. And in fact, um, if you think about it, Bill, who created this website, found out that his sister was taking this medication. And when he found that out, they discussed it, and she stopped taking it. So <clears throat> in the last year, we have been going absolutely insane over four letters, GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation. Whilst you might think, well, it's kind of annoying and I don't really care, um, it's actually going to affect your, affect your job. It's going to affect the way that you process data. It's going to affect the way that you're scrutinized in the event of a disaster. And <clears throat> so let's just get an idea of what GDPR is. I'm not going to go specifically into it. I know it's boring sometimes, but let's give an overview. So the GDPR can be grouped into or is supported by six principles. The very first one is um, that kind of sets the tone for the whole thing is information that is processed must be done so lawfully, transparently, and uh, fairly. Now, what does that mean? Lawfully, as you can imagine, means legally. Uh, but it, it's more than that. It's, um, think of, you ha basically, you have to have a business case for why you need this information, as well as how long you can keep it. So think of um, vital interest. Uh, is, is, is it a medical situation, so you need their medical information to treat them? Or do you have a contract between the or the consumer and you, like terms and conditions that say, I'm going to process this information, it's going to store this long, and I'm going to share it with these people. You know, you have to have a legitimate reason, and you have to, you know, present that to the consumer. So the second one is transparently. Again, if I'm going to process your information, I have to tell you what information I'm processing, how I'm going to do it. And then the third one is fairly. So not only have I told you what I'm going to do and what information I'm going to take, but I also have to stick to that. I have to be honest and I have to actually process it in that way. I can't reuse it. And through ethical hacking, we've actually found that a lot of companies like to collect a lot of data and then store it off somewhere, sometimes forget about it, but in the, the purpose of reusing it later for other things. 
in GDPR, you can't do that. You have no legal business doing that, and so you actually will uh, face consequences. So I'm going to point out five things to me that the GDPR really will affect how you do your job and will affect um, kind of the process. So the first one is when a company is breached today, typically the organization is held accountable or should be held accountable. Unfortunately, with GDPR, or I guess fortunately, um, the directors will now be personally rely, uh, personally um, liable. So you can sue a director of an organization, and they can face fines, but they can also go to jail. And the second point, and actually, just to go on to that, you can use that because when people bring the when you bring the risk closer to home, people are more willing to pay attention, and you can get it to get a better budget. <laughs> The second thing is fines. So currently, um, if you announce that you have a breach, I mean, biggest considerations that I've found with organizations doing breach response and incident response has been, well, what's the impact financially? But now, not only are you worried about what the impact financially is, what the downtime is, but you can face fines up to 2 to 4% of your global turnover, as well as 10 to 20 million euros, whichever is the greater. And then the third thing, which really affected how I presented this to people, uh, to organizations, is currently you have to, if you have to notify, you only have to do it in certain places sometimes, especially the states, it's really confusing. The minute you cross the line, it's completely different requirements. I'm Canadian, I want to clarify. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Just saying. Uh, but now, you have 72 hours to not only declare that you've been breached, but have mitigations that you will put in place for next time to minimize impact or reduce the likelihood, as well as lessons learned. You have to have a formal process to say, this is what we learned in this incident, which is something that most people forget. So not only do you have to, you have to declare it to the ICO or the legal, um, regulatory body, wherever you are, and you also have to do it in 72 hours with the expectation that you will notify them the minute you're aware. Not at 72 hours, on the dot, you hand over a report. It's the minute you're aware, by the way, we've been breached and this is what we're doing, because then it will actually help reduce those fines. The fourth thing is you have to have a data, uh, what was it, data protection officer in-house. And this person doesn't have a operations role. Um, they're simply there to provide information and guidance. Although, from a cyber background, um, I would almost say they're like an insider because they don't report to you. They report to the regulatory body. So they can then say, well, you're not following my standards or the standards that are put on you, so I'm going to go tell on you, essentially. I have younger siblings. It happens all the time. It's awful. Um, but... <laughs> But if you think about it, you can't just fire them either because they're going to have enhanced, um, uh, what's the word, enhanced, uh, I wrote it down because I knew I'd forget it, enhanced um, employment rights, that's the word. And so you have to have them working for you for a minimum of two years. You can't just say, well, you don't really fit with the organization, so we're going to shut you at the door. <laughs> Sorry, did I skip one? Oh, no, we're good. Um, and the last one, and the one that actually is my most, the one I try to get across the most, and the one that I find is really cool, is privacy by design. So this is not the minute your project is done, the minute your product is ready for sale, okay, we're going to retest it now, and then we're going to find out all the issues with it. No, it's from the concept of design. It's from the minute you have that idea. So when you design a project that you're going to, put up on GitHub or you're going to go do, you have to think of security but also privacy uh, controls from the start. So you have to implement it in your design. You have to look at, as I said earlier, minimal data. So only what you have a business case to take and you have to think of how long you can store it. And one thing that people often forget, which you've probably come across, is when a person does I think it's called a personal subject access request or subject access request. And that is 
I'm going to call Scott, and I want to know all of the information, because he's a business, he's not a person, obviously. <laughs> I'm gonna, I want to know all the information that you have on me. And you have to, within 30 days, provide that information. And that's not business days, that's 30 days in general. So one month, a little bit over February. However, there have been situations, we had a client, that <laughs> there was a person, or a company, that um, they were a private members club, which I'm sure you know what that is. And they had a routine, a private members club, you don't know this. <laughs> but they had a routine, or a culture of writing rude comments on the people coming in. They would um, write you about what they thought of you coming in. However, what happens when you do a subject access, access request and a new person does that request and doesn't sanitize the information? I will tell you, it leads to very, very poor reputation following and a lot of legal work. Um, so you have to be mindful of what information you're doing, how you're storing it, as well as how is this going to affect in the future because you'll be an, under a lot more scrutiny. And the last one, which you can imagine, is you can only share information with those who require it. This is in your organization, but also third parties. Uh, looking at something like uh, the session replay scripts. I mean, I'm sure you've read, I think it was in November, they were reported quite, quite a lot on organizations that had session replay, um, on the session replay scripts on their website in an effort to better understand how people interact with the website. However, it also is found out that they were giving private information to third parties. And those third parties would, you know, you would sign into the website on HTTPS, awesome. However, those third parties were using HTTP to replay. And it was giving information such as your credit card details, your password, um, somebody logging in to get a new prescription. It would give you the details because those were displayed. It gave you the details of their medical conditions as well as the medications they're taking. And that is highly sensitive information but they didn't really consider that when they added in that third party. And actually, from those articles, they stopped using them, some of them stopped using it. But that was something that you have to consider from the conception of your idea, not just at the end when a security researcher says, by the way, you're doing this and it's wrong. <clears throat> so now we're gonna look at Equifax. And I'm sure you've all heard of it, I would hope. Um, you may be in it. Uh, but basically, I'm not going to go through this blame game. I completely hate when one person is blamed for this entire organization. A lot of times, anytime there's a disaster, you know, somebody's fired. It's like, oh, it was actually all of David's fault. It was his fault. Nobody else's, just his. In reality, if one system having one issue, irregardless of how fast you patched it, can affect your entire system, you've actually failed in the design phase. You failed all the way in the beginning before anything was implemented. As a network architect in my background, I designed the network based on likely scenarios. I based it on the threat actors, I did threat mapping, I kind of figured out what the vulnerabilities in that, in those, um, sorry, those trends in that industry, I looked at who may want to attack my client, and I designed a network around that. And I also tested throughout implementing, not just does it work, because typically in development as well as in networking, people want it to work. You know, they want it to work for their job, but they also need it to work in a stressful environment when somebody is doing something it shouldn't be that shouldn't be done. <clears throat> Where am I now? I lost track of myself. So um, let's look at identity, uh, sorry, identify, protect, and educate. So in identify, from the top down, people didn't understand in Equifax what information they were taking in. They didn't understand the value of it. They didn't, because if they did, there'd be greater budget put towards securing it. There'd be greater controls and they would have done it effectively and actually caught it probably a little bit sooner than after I think it was two months <clears throat> or more actually. But um, the other thing is 
when it comes to protecting, if you don't do that first step of identifying your data, you're not going to prioritize it properly because we all have budgets and we all have to align with that budget and we cannot in any way implement these highly secure technical controls on every freaking thing in our network. It's just not gonna be effective, it's not gonna work. You're going to get reports on the most random things as well as nobody will pay attention to them. And it's gonna cost so much that people are just not going to maintain it. So the first step, as I said, identify. The second step is prioritize around that. So put in controls based on the information that you're containing. And the third one, educate. So it's no longer okay for senior level execs to say, you're doing something wrong, you failed at this, you did that. In reality, it should be us bragging about what we can do. So one of my friends, uh, Dr. Jessica Barker, she talks about social proof. So uh, you want to say things like, instead of this many people failed with this password, you want to say this many people succeeded in being secure. The reason is because people look at the negative and say, well, everyone else is failing, so why don't I fail? It's, it's kind of doomed from the start. So if you say, you know, this is this many people passed, then be like, well, these people succeeded, so I can succeed. But it's also kind of, it's, it's, I know it doesn't directly align with, but it's similar to when you go to an organization, you go to your boss and you say, oh, I failed on this, oh, this, this breach happened, oh, this happened. Instead, you should say, actually, I stopped this many attacks. I secured against these many things. And yes, one failed, but I'm still freaking awesome. I'm still your superstar, don't worry. <laughs> and we, in the, or you in the dev community, need to start, you know, you, you need to start bragging about yourself, start saying, you know, we can do this and we can do that, because you're familiar with automation. You're familiar with very quick up and down cloud instances. You're, you're familiar with automated testing and automated builds. You, you understand that. You understand putting controls, so it chooses the, um, currently best library and so on. You know what that is. So why don't you implement privacy into that? And actually, I think I have a really good, uh, I'll do that in a second, but <laughs> I have a good quote for that. Um, but basically, you need to lead the way because you're already good at it. You already know what you're doing. So just add one thing into it because it's not going to affect how fast you are. If you do it properly, if you do it in the design, you're still going to be as productive, you're still going to be as quick, but you'll also be secure. And so when you're scrutinized in the future, you know, you'll be like, yeah, but I did this and I did that. So uh, you could be uh, the superhero that they didn't deserve, but they so sorely needed. <laughs> a little bit cheesy, but it's okay. So you can think, instead of when something happens, when, when there's a breach, instead of being, oh, you know, I should have done this, and the decision I made actually led to that breach. Instead, you can say, you know what, we were breached, something did fail. However, the decision that I made actually minimized the impact. So I secured this with, yeah, I mean, the standard is this, but I did it even better. And so now, even though that client's information has been taken, that information won't be affected because it'll take them years to un understand it, to be able to process it. Whereas in that case, you actually solved an issue that you maybe didn't expect, but you still did it, and you still protected, ultimately you protected your users. So I'm actually going quite quickly through this, but that's okay. I'm on my last slide. So the thing is, how do you actually implement these things in your workplace? And so I narrowed it down to three. There's still more. I mean, these are just trying to get you to start thinking about it. But the, the first one is risk assessment and privacy, assess or pri privacy impact assessment. This is identifying the information. How is it going to transform? What are we going to do with it? How long are we going to keep it? What is it? But privacy impact is what's going to happen when something happens to it? What's going to happen if that becomes public? How is that going to affect our, co our consumers? It's not, I mean, I'm not going to necessarily care what medication Troy Hunt takes, but he might be upset if everybody else knows. 
<laughs> Don't sit in the front. That's the most. Um, is it going to affect your ability to get along? I mean, Ashley Madison, is it going to wreck your relationships? Is it going to make you feel hopeless? Is it going to ultimately lead to a couple people actually committing suicide? I mean, how horrendous is that? And how are you going to feel knowing something you did potentially could have led to that or something you did protected against that, which, as you all know, you're superstars, and you can do that. You need to be the first line of defense for your users. You need to protect the information, but empower the user to take back control and protect um, and try, um, sorry, and treat that information with respect that it deserves, which I think is a quote I had at the beginning. And the next one, um, looking at like talk talk, consider talk talk, um, after the breach, you know, it's a big breach, it was a big incident, but then all of those users received targeted, well, maybe not all, but quite a few of them received spear phishing emails, so targeted phishing emails. But how are they going to be able to protect themselves against that? Because they're not, not all of them are technical, and they, all of the indicators to indicate that it was a legitimate email is in that email because it's already known. So how could you have separated out the information or minimized the impact? And that sort of thing. I had an end point, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> so that one, to me, kind of looks at the first domain, which is identify. You know, do the risk assessment from the beginning. Do a privacy impact statement, because those two things together are going to help you in the next step in how to protect it properly and effectively. The next one is good security principles in place doesn't need to stop running at pace. It rhymes, so you can remember it better. I have to give credit to David because he made that up at like 2 in the morning. Um, but basically, um, as I said before, you're familiar with automation. You know how to do scanning. You know how to do quick life cycles of machines up and down. Great. You are familiar with implementing new technologies. However, do things in privacy first. Look at privacy. Look at the risk. Look at how it's going. Like in the beginning, when we do the risk assessment and the privacy impact assessment, you know, look at that when you're considering how you're going to do this. I like to tell people, I mean, I, I speak to young people getting into industry, et cetera, um, quite a bit. And I try, I try to tell them how to make your presentation or how do you make your statements more impactful is bringing the risk closer to home. So think about, for speaking to someone else, think about how to impact their life, like their family, their friends, their children. Children are very effective when you want to get your point across. Um, but use that sparingly. <laughs> um, but also, think about it for yourself. How would you feel if your brother, sister, mom, father, grandparent, children, if they used your service, if they used your product, if you contained, if you had their personal information. In Bill's case, in the very first story I told you, his sister was taking that medication and she stopped taking it. And I mean, the title is a pretty good indicator. He's ashamed of that code because of what happened. So if he had thought in the beginning of what potentially could have happened, because one of his colleagues did say to him, you do realize that this questionnaire is flawed. And he's like, yeah, I know, that's cool. <laughs> but if he had really figured out what that meant, he probably would have reassessed how he was going to deal with it. You have experience as DevOps, as whichever sector you're in. You you can bring that into your client meeting. So if a client says, I want X, Y, Z done, you can actually say, well, that's awesome. I mean, I can do it, I'm awesome. But have you considered this? Or what about this? And don't say, you're stupid. Say, because that's not effective, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> say, well, you know, I've actually dealt with this before. This is a really good idea and actually, this, although it's not necessarily required, can actually lead the way because Media portray breaches all, or present breaches all the time, and they actually help to motivate people to be more secure. As somebody that 
advertises themselves as an ethical hacker. I mean, yes, a lot of times I do get things like, how do I know if I'm being stalked? How do, how do I track my girlfriend? Unfortunately, I get that a lot. Um, how do I access this person's account? Can you access it for me? That's a, say no to that. Um, or uh, young people asking, is my personal information public? Like, do, are my nude photos public? However, because of the media, it's also led to organizations saying, I want to implement privacy into my life cycle. I want to implement privacy from the beginning to protect not only my users, not only the internal people, but also my clients. And if, if they already have that motivation, then it's really, I'm not going to say easy, but it will assess. And you saying, well, what about this idea? Because you've seen it before. You know what's going to fall or what's going to fail. So you know, use your knowledge. And the last one is, um, or actually I was going to mention one thing about that one. You can use things like frameworks to measure against, such as ISO 27101, I think. Um, and so just as an example, I'm not saying you all have to learn that. But you could, there are things that exist out there, and they are going to be continually de developing as of May because everybody has to align with GDPR. So align yourself with a standard. Um, and try and work against that. One other example I had was in my last organization, we dealt with a lot of very sensitive data and had a highly, like, huge impact if that ever got out. And due to the nature of the work that I did, which was ethical hacking and open source intelligence and building um, a privacy picture of our clients or the malicious actors after them, etc., if that information got out, it would be devastating. But if it got into the wrong hands as well, it could be also devastating. And I don't want to, I wouldn't want to impact people negatively because my goal, my passion is to educate and protect. So what we did is we actually, um, we created a board of ethics. And when something didn't quite seem right or didn't align with what we wanted, it didn't align with how we wanted to direct our organization, we brought it up to the Board of Ethics. And whilst you might think, well, I mean, that's a lot of work, but but it's actually hugely beneficial because if I raise an, an issue and they assess, oh, well, actually, that's acceptable, it's not a big deal, I haven't wasted time because the group's already formed, the, pro uh, the process has already been practiced, and they know what to do. And sometimes it did lead to alternative solutions, but having a kind of an independent view makes it more effective because you're like, can you sanity check this? Because to me, this makes 100% sense. To you, it might not at all. <laughs> it, just, it just happens that way. Um, and the last one is educate. Whilst it's important to tell your consumers, legally, it's important to tell your consumers what information you're going to use, it's also important to realize that top execs sometimes are so far removed that it's not their fault they don't understand. It's actually, they just, they just can't. They don't get it. And so it's your job to inform them. How many people in this room, outside of this conference, have attended formal secure coding practices? For exam, um, yeah, OK. That's like five or six or seven. OK, that's not bad. Now look at, actually, your extended teams. You know, you get it, OK. I mean, you care about security. That's why you're here. But look at your other teams, especially people that don't get it. Bring the risk to them, help them understand, and as well as that will help you follow the trends in industry. It will help you keep your threat map up to date. And you can actually connect with other people. Conferences are a great way. Training courses are a great way to see what they do in their place. And maybe you have a very similar scenario, and they've, said, they've dealt with before, so they can help you. They can advise you. I mean, sometimes don't listen to some things they say, but some things apply. So, as I said, we need to be the first line of defense for our users, our consumers. We need to empower those users to protect themselves, but also treat the information with the respect that it deserves. We need to say no when organizations want to put in our terms and conditions, the, remove the ability for us to sue after. We need to stand up when our IoT devices have never been tested for exploitability. And we need to say, 
we need to say something if we market our products or our solution as 100% secure when we know very well that no external person has ever viewed that product. I'm not saying this is going to solve everything. However, by protecting those who cannot protect themselves and by bringing the liability back to the manufacturer, we can actually work towards creating a more secure and safer world. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty sure that was quite short, but that's okay. Now you guys have to ask me a million questions, including that is my favorite fetish. Any questions? So you're asking if somebody's presenting your research as their own? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that one's a hard one because I mean, yes, all the information that belongs to you is is yours. However. There are some times where there's reasons that they can, they can keep it, um, such as like back home, my first position as a sysadmin was at an accounting firm. And legally, they have to retain those files for I think it's seven years that can be held up in court, so it has to be on a certain format. So I could, I mean, I'm not in the EU, but I could ask for it and I could say, you have to delete it. And they would be able to delete the information that they can delete, but not what they legally have to retain. If that makes sense. Any more questions? I, I do have an issue with that. I, I mean, I get it. I, I, I like it. It's good. It's a motivation to do it. But also, I don't think people should be... Yeah, they should want to do it. You, my, my goal... Yeah, they don't. That's true. Because I remember you... Pre I'm pretty sure you presented one time or wrote an article about how, you know, Dropbox has the option to use 2FA, but only 1% or something use it. Thankfully, I use it. I checked. <laughs> Double checked. But basically, I'm... Um, my goal is to motivate people to care about their own information because sometimes they don't know they have a right to privacy. Sometimes they say, oh, you know, only, only a bad person needs privacy. But that's not true. And before one of the versions, one of the versions back on my slides, is I present why that's not true. And that's looking at things like when somebody that I'm not going to name that has ecstasy pills in his face, which if you attended his talk, you'd know. Um, but he said that, you know, transgenders are too expensive. And I'm like, okay, you can't do that. That's not, that's not okay. And I'm not saying they have to be private. It has to be private information. But that's still using information against you. You know, if in, uh, in Cairo, I believe, uh, they, yes, it was Cairo, they used Grindr, the police used Grindr to target men using it. If you don't know, Grindr is a dating app for um, men that are interested in other men. It's not legal in that country. It's not illegal. But they did use it to round up men that are interested in men, gay people or gay men, I guess. Um, and it, they targeted them, and then they arrested them. And I'm sorry, but I do not want to be in the Cairo jail. In Texas, four men pretended to be a, um, a male looking for another male and came to that other man's house, the fifth man's house, and verbally and physically abused him and then robbed him. And it could have ended even worse, but even that is terrifying. I mean, how scary would it be to then go on their next date knowing that it could be four very burly men that are afraid of their own sexuality to target you? You know, like, 
don't know if I actually answered your question. Sometimes I get in a rant. Uh, okay. Basically, you have to motivate people outside of being like, oh, financial. Also motivate them saying, this is your information. You have a right to it, and this is how you do it. Bring the risk closer to them so they understand. When I do personal privacy talks, I talk about children, family, elderly parents, etc. Because parents, especially parents, care a lot about young people and their their right to privacy and their right to be safe. Does that answer? Okay. I don't have you guys gonna have to stay with no one. <laughs> um, but again, we are hiring. Come take my card. Work with me, please. <laughs> Thank you.